like even you're like, okay, this doesn't work for me, but it's not like this is broken. And so I can't, nor is it I'm broken. And so I can't, it's like, yes. okay, from the place of, you know, of feeling that sense of worth and knowing that you can choose, you get to decide what's the best way to set myself up within the circumstances and how I, I can change the circumstances, but it's the motivation that you're coming from is different. There's no avoidance. It's about the thing that you want and a sense of ability and empowerment to do that and get that. Welcome back to the Mind Change Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Heather McKean, and back with us today is Mackenzie Brewster. Hey, y'all. Today, we are going to be talking about feedback and when do we change internally versus when we need to change things externally. So before we go on, please take this opportunity to subscribe, download, follow, all of those things that you need to do to help us to keep creating new content, free content. Uh, We would love to see your reviews, what you are liking about the podcast, and it just helps us get better, and we wanna do this for you. So uh, do all of those things and help us help you. All right, thanks. Okay, here we go. Welcome back. Thank you. Again. Thanks for having me. All right, so feedback. Yeah. When do we change? internally versus possibly the need to change things externally. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was a topic that you had particular interest in. I did. Yes. Yes. Could could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, this was sort of me taking the opportunity to get to talk with you about this one because it's been uh, a point of curiosity for me, one that's sometimes a little bit sticky of trying to decide and discern. It it feels like we talk a lot about this idea of like a victim model and a victor model, right? And we, we just did an episode not that long ago where we talked about how other people have external narratives about us um, and the ways that we can interact with that, interact with that, this idea of scripts. Um, but in, so we kind of put the power back into us, right. And how we get to choose to respond. And so one thing that I have found as I've gone along the way in this journey is finding a balance between when are the times when, um, I just am responding to things based on my programming, right. And there are things for me to change. And when are the times where the feedback that I'm getting from my body is actually the thing that's meant to help drive me into a different situation? Yes. Uh Welcome to this stage of your journey. (laughs) (laughs) So I say that because I see this is an evolution in you doing the work. Yeah. And, And many other people who have done a lot of the mind change method Mm -hmm. and have seen a lot of growth and transformation in their own lives often get to this point. Mm -hmm. And I make that distinction because this is not generally the questions we have in the beginning. Yeah. And I actually think that's okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're probably retroactively looking back and being like, wait, what was that? Should I have maybe, right? A little bit, but that's, I think that part of the reason is the, the journey really is about trust. It really is about retraining our brain to understand what safety feels like, looks like, sounds like, and our experience with it. Yeah. And that comes with time. Hmm. So I say that because had I came come in with this reference of like, wait, do I need to change or do they need to change? Yeah. I probably would have almost always defaulted to they need to change mm-hmm. because that was my framework was that I was the way I was because of my external circumstances, Yeah, which we sort of lump into the definition of the victim mindset. Mm-hmm. Okay. So as we evolve and we start to learn more about ourselves, 
we start to learn more about the way we operate, what feels safe, even moving past safety, which is our goal, right? Right, and getting into like, let me live my life, the fullness of life, and yeah. That the bravery of stretching beyond our known uh, environment and exploring, yeah, right. Starting to get into exploration, mm -hmm. we start to ask this question from a, a more responsible point of view. Mm -hmm. So I do want to go into it because I think it's important. But I do think it's also important to notate if you happen to be coming in on this conversation at the beginning of your mind change journey, Yeah, understand that this is part of the evolutionary process, I would think. Does that make sense? That does make sense because there are so much the automatic is to go to, I'm this way because of everything outside of me. This is the issue. Um, and there is so much groundwork to lay first or to undo first in a lot of ways, yeah. both actually deconstructing and reconstructing or reconnecting rather, um, of the automatic responses that we have, what's informing our view. There's just, there's kind of like a base layer that we'll work through. I think part of the curiosity for me in this is I see both where the, the assumption is uh, not just that they have to change, right? Or like, oh, I have to change everything outside of me so that I can have the experience that I want, but can go to the, oh, well, I should be, I should be able to operate. I'm, I hear the should, right? Yes. But like, I should be able to operate in this way. I should be fine in this circumstance. If I have all the power, like, I, I think I went through a phase where it was like, oh, it's not about anything outside of me. I have the power to change. Let me change me. And I'd start there so much and stay there so long and then get to the point of, well, okay, I've changed me so much and not like a, I'm changing me, but just come in with curiosity, recognition, like, huh, that's interesting that I'm having this level of a response when I'm in this work environment. Let me, let me sort through the belief systems that that reveals to me, the experiences that I've had, and I can change my relationship with something. But sometimes it seems like what actually helps the growth is to move into something else. Mm. <laughs> but being able to recognize what those moments are, because there are other times where I, I would then switch into, no, it's the circumstances. And if all of this was different, then I could be the way that I wanted to be. And there was actually, I was just at a sticking point of, oh, I'm just at a point of challenge. I'm hitting something deeper. That's the opportunity for me to work through. But being able to discern those moments is a little bit Right. And you're able to look back on it now because you've come so far. Oh, that's true. So the thing is that understanding that we see and experience life through lenses, right? through filters. Yeah. And a lot of those, the majority of those filters were given to us in our childhood from primary caregivers, whatever our particular culture taught us, the our environment. Yeah. Put filters, glasses on, if you will lenses, multiple lenses. We really need the known, felt, lived experience of removing filters and seeing things so differently than we did before or knowing things so differently than we did before to move into this reflective place that you're at now okay. where we choose, yeah. where we know we have choice. Mm. That's so important. Okay. So from the, the, the standpoint of enough neurobiology has changed that now empowerment power is, is known and a default. Yeah. If, if we, and, and it, people can jump into this too early. Mm -hmm. If we jump into, into it too early, like I'm aware now, I still see through lenses. Mm -hmm. I know that I have filters. Yeah because I have so much experience with removing them right. that I can now assess my situations knowing I'm probably seeing through filters. Mm -hmm. I don't even know, have to know what they are always or to quote unquote fix them because yeah. it's not broken. So right. it doesn't need fixing. Uh, at, some, at some points, it would not actually be safe for me to move around that filter until I have some known experience with it. Yeah. So I think that that's important first. Okay. And that's what a relationship with mind change 
and the method does is really if if we work through our steps and we <laughs> make it sound like we're in rehab, but <laughs> if we go through all of the different things that that we hit on and we have a, a safe haven, we understand safety, what mm -hmm. it feels like, looks like, sounds like, smells like in our body. Yeah. So important. Uh, not even important. Just vital. Necess vital to the necessity. Absolute necessity yeah. to moving through being able to think about our filters. Mm -hmm. Then the empowerment, worth, value. If those things aren't rehearsed enough, practiced enough that they're inherent to some degree, we're never looking for perfection that doesn't exist. Right. But if it isn't part of our automatic response, we're not ready yet. You know? Yeah. And the, the, the thing is, is the question with all of this is going to be the placement of power. Yeah. Where we place power. And so often those of us who find ourselves coming in, chronic illness, addiction, mental health concerns, stuckness in relationships, yeah. something that we've identified as like, I've tried so many things and this isn't working, <laughs> Yeah, which is where most people end up, mm -hmm. how they end up here with mind change is that understanding of power, empowerment, and that we are taught as children, it's a failure to mature, but not, we can't see that through a blame, shamey, right, judgmental. Not like failure, just mean this hasn't happened, then the maturation that's necessary yes. isn't Because we live yet. in a society that does not support that. So that's right there, Yeah, one of those things of like, what needs to change. Right. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt your thought if you're no, going no, no, somewhere. Go I can keep well, it. Well, it's because part of it is, you know, sometimes people come in with a problem, right, that they see as the problem. And and this idea that we can kind of change anything, right? We know that we can input output, but sometimes it's like we're we don't even recognize that we're working within a frame that has presupposes like presuppositions yeah. that may not actually be the thing that helps us the most, that serves us the most. Like I think about, you know, there was that a time where we had so much less recess and natural play for children. And so they're having a hard time sitting still in classrooms. And it's like, oh man, look at that problem child and wanting to medicate them because they can't. But what we were asking of them was unnecessary, like was actually not healthy or helpful. And they weren't the issue. The circumstances of what we were asking is more so the issue. And not that anything has to, I'm at a point now where not everything has to be a problem to be a preference. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and I, so things like that, or I think about, you know, there's this, um, upsurge in our identification of, Hey, we all have different strengths. We process in different ways. Some of those are natural. Some of those are adaptions that have come about from maybe, um, not ideal circumstances, but here's the brilliance of how our brain has responded and like what are the points of you know where we're looking at the thing that we're aiming towards that we want to change is this is this because this is like a cultural thing or is this actually an issue does this make sense it totally okay. makes sense it totally okay. makes sense okay. i've had a harder time completely framing this but i just it's just it's something that comes up to me like this more subtle thing with victor victim mindset and this level of discernment in in the empowered choice of like when do we choose to change ourselves and when is the empowered choice to be like oh you know what okay cool i'm actually gonna how i'm gonna handle this is i'm gonna change my circumstances but when i'm doing that it's like it's not necessarily changing it like the the power isn't in the environment it's almost like i'm actively choosing to change my environment to better support this thing that i'm trying to cultivate yes okay Let's break this down into a few practical examples okay. that I think would be helpful. Okay. Let's take the one you used with children. Yeah. I, I would feel that it's, it, we would be hard pressed for anyone out there. I say this and then I'm thinking, how are we still in this though? For anyone to say that our, our public education system is conducive to health of and, and the the natural process of a child, yeah, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. So, but then, so then our answer then is change the system. Anybody, 
I would think knows that that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, yeah. nor I can't, as much as I would love to see that change in my lifetime, I just don't know how that's actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. So then how do we handle that? Yeah. Do we go in and program a child to sit still for eight hours a day with information bombarding them? Is that... My eyes are open so wide right yeah. now in the horror of the idea of that. Right. <laughs> no, that would be... Yeah. So, so th this is sort of sounding like we have the power to actually do that. We don't. Mm. That goes against natural programming. That goes against design. Yeah. That just... We, we can't go in and make changes against design. Then we're dealing with maladaption. Yeah. And that we would never be wanting wanting to do. Mm -hmm. Nor, I think, can we. We give ourselves way too much power and credit thinking that we can go in and program a child to sit and do this. No people out there, world, society, we can't. And that's the problem. Right. But now we're just trying to medicate them into submission and into this, you know, different... It, the framework's broken. So... No. <laughs> now then, how would we deal with a child in that situation? Yeah. It's all, we can help a child in that environment. Mm -hmm. What do we then just leave them? Right. We give them nothing. No, we empower them. We go in and we help them understand that it's society is broken, not you. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the, you shouldn't have to sit for eight hours a day. Yeah. How do we then empower that child to make a different choice? Well, that's going to look a lot of, obviously <laughs> then this really gets into stuff because you have to have parents on board to help that child figure out what, if they were given agency mm -hmm. and we remove that there's anything wrong with them, because that's what's happened. Society, the education system, and we're not trying to turn, turn this into a no, complete, <laughs> like, no. <laughs> you know, story on the education system, but it's a great example and you brought it up, that what that does, children do not have the framework to understand that the society is broken, that the, that the, the system is broken. Mm -hmm. Then they internalize it. That's what children do. Right. So they feel broken. Yeah. That's what we can help. And that's, I think that's part of where sometimes I'm like, not sure as I'm encountering some sort of challenge. I'm like, okay, let me deal with all of the beliefs that come up about myself, how I feel about this. But then there are things where should we be able, like finding the balance of, because there's been so much of that internalization of there's something wrong with me or I'm broken or, you know, a sense of helplessness. It's like, okay, great. Working through so many layers of that. And then when is it that Oh man, I'm getting stuck on it. Like, when is it that we we can recognize that and yet not put any like outsource the power, put any blame on it? Be like, well, the, you know what I mean. Instead of like, well, the culture's broken and I'm fine, and if they would just, you know what I mean? Like, that's a so we just have to change all that. I have to get away from all of that. I think the very awareness, yeah, that that there's a both, yeah, is is an arrival to some degree. Okay, great. <laughs> so let's let's keep using that example. Uh, how would we work with a child in doing that? First of all, we have to assume the parents are completely on board with the empowerment of the child. Mm -hmm. That's a big assumption and that's really difficult because it's usually parents have figured out a way to survive their own experience with that same education system, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just say we have completely on board parents who are willing to support the, the agency and the well-being of the child. So let's say they want to stay in the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do we, we clear anything for that child, that the programming that there's anything wrong with them and they understand they're engaging from their own choice. Mm -hmm. They're engaging with a system that's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That changes everything right there. Mm. Then the child goes, okay, what choices do I have within the system? So it's coming from a place of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Then the child may say, all right, do I have any agency over my schedule? Do I have an ability? <laughs> this is a lot for a child. <laughs> such a lot. But mm -hmm. I have seen it 
in some children. Okay. Now, when we're talking about before the age of 11, this just, it doesn't, it really doesn't exist. Yeah. That we do not have the amount of prefrontal cortex activity to think abstractly, yeah. to think in these realms. So that's really hard. So they're outsourcing all of that rightfully so right to it's, a primary caregiver it's developmentally appropriate yes but this is helpful to take this as an example to then like graduate to let's say that you are a um a high school student or a college student or you know you're an adult and you're interacting with your work environment you're interacting with your community yes and the same it's the same sort of framework and metric of okay i'm in something i'm engaging with a system and how do I choose to do that, not make putting the sole responsibility? It's almost like cultivating your relationship with it. Yeah. So let's graduate that out to a 14-year-old, 15-year-old who yeah. maybe now is in high school. Mm -hmm. Even though I think middle school, some children have some agency and schedule. Mm -hmm. But let's just take a 14-year-old, 15-year-old child that is maybe does have scheduling. They can understand, I need to put in physical movement and some other thing into my schedule so I can have this class and then I need this and then I have this class and then I need this. And they can work with that and understand that within this system that is trying to ask us to do this, they're asking me to do something that actually isn't, I, I'm not going to thrive in. Yeah. So me thriving is my responsibility. Mm. Can I thrive within this system? And they may find some ability to do that within their schedule. Mm -hmm. What that does is they understand that they're dealing with a system that's not fantastic, mm -hmm. but they're going to thrive anyway. Mm, okay. Because they've got now some agency over schedule. Now there may be another child who is like, okay, the way that I'm going to thrive is outside of the public education system. I'm, I'm going to choose to online school, homeschool, co-op school, however, school outside of traditional schooling. Mm -hmm. That's the way I'm taking agency. And that's the way I'm going to handle this. But I, if, if my motivation is it's broken, I keep like, I have mental health disorders now because of it. I have ADD yeah. because of this or, or I can't because I have ADD or ADHD. Yeah. Um, <laughs> every child would have ADD, ADD, ADHD trying to exist in that system, it doesn't work with brain development. It just doesn't. Now, yeah. I'm not saying that that's, that's a whole different system with people who are actually diagnosed those things. And let me tell you, though, it's, it's part of why it's so hard yeah. is because the system isn't working correctly. But that's the important thing. We have to establish worth, mm -hmm. value, mm -hmm. agency, yeah. that, that like personal empowerment first. Okay then they can decide what they can and cannot do within the, the, the system. It's like where it's coming from is so different. There's not something that you're trying to get away from. There's no blame. There's no judgment. There's nothing like even you're like, okay, this doesn't work for me, but it's not like this is broken. And so I can't, nor is it I'm broken. And so I can't, it's like, yes. okay, from the place of, you know, of feeling that sense of worth and knowing that you can choose, you get to decide what's the best way to set myself up within the circumstances and how I, I can change the circumstances, but it's the motivation that you're coming from is different. There's no avoidance. It's about the thing that you want and a sense of ability and empowerment to do that and get that. It, it's anyone who makes lasting transformational change yeah is coming from that motivation okay is the 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 choice the agency the sovereignty of that and understanding for them personally they don't thrive in this environment and would do better in some other way okay so can we take this to something that's a little bit more sensitive Oh, do you have oh. another example? Oh, go for it. No, I, mean, well, I was going to go. maybe do, <laughs> let's give the public education system a break. Yeah. Um, food to me is a good one. Okay, great. So in my health journey, yeah. oh, did I try every possible diet, not diet in the sense of trying to lose weight, diet in the, I kept thinking food was the problem. 
oh, this is a really good place to talk about this. I yeah, needed yeah, yeah. Okay. to change what food was coming in or the problems within me were happening from the food mm -hmm. that I was eating, mm -hmm. which led me to first was a diagnosis of celiac disease. It runs evidently in the family, right? This whole genetic component, which still doesn't mean anything other than it's this is a program that's been happening in my family for a long time. So then, oh, cutting out gluten. That was my first like big change. So then I thought everything's going to change when I cut out gluten. There, what I didn't understand at the time was it was reinforcing a victim mentality for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. That, that, and, and the power I was giving was in the avoidance of gluten. Okay. Yeah. Boy, do I wish that it would have stopped there, but it never does folks it just never stops there. Then it's grains in general, which led me to paleo eating for like five or six years, right? And you see these little, so this is what I want to talk about with food. It's probably another whole episode, but mm -hmm. what I, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there with all of this. Okay. We're along for the journey. F food is just food. <laughs> we give so much power and I didn't realize how much power I was giving to food. Now, the reason that oftentimes when I would either remove something from my diet or add something, you know, whatever, to some degree, I would have some moments of feeling better. Mm -hmm. What I recognize now was those moments of feeling better were because I was asserting some agency. Mm. I was giving myself some power. Yeah. Right. But in the end, I wasn't giving myself power. It was the food. But those little moments of I have choice and I can do something to help myself was what was actually making me feel better, okay? Ah, okay? And it never lasted. I'd always have to remove something else. So something else then was caused, because then I'd start to feel the same way I was feeling before. Because you're and working with the same metric of is something outside of me is doing something to me. Yes. But the, but the relief came from when you had that sense of power, agency rising up, okay. Right, yeah, the problem with that is that you'll get to the point where you can't eat anything. Mm -hmm. You're allergic to everything, allergic, intolerant yeah. to everything. I remember one time <laughs> I just like broke down in it because I was seeing so many doctors and it was like so many ideas of, you know, what not to eat. And it's like, what can I eat? It was like, there was so much power in avoiding these things and it never really helped all that much. The biggest change that I had in my relationship with food was not about food. It was... <laughs> No, food's about love. Yeah. Food's about nurturing. Mm -hmm. it's, the food's about being nurtured and about being fed emotionally mm -hmm. more than anything. And if that didn't happen in early childhood for nobody's bad reason, right? if there was malnutrition in that way, we will have a disorganized relationship with food. It just is. Mm -hmm. So that journey took me... I mean, you just go to the point where you cannot eat anything anymore and everything's giving you, and your body's doing the symptoms. So you really think that mm -hmm. it really seems like that to the point where you just don't eat anything anymore. So that is another, I think, great example of this, of like, when do you change? Like it, I had to change me. Mm -hmm. I had to change my ability to absorb nutrients of love and safety and regulation before my body could ever process food correctly. Mm. Right. So that's yeah. another one of those places that we do that. We keep thinking it's the food that either gives us what we need or is causing us the problems that we have. I remember there came a point where I did a lot changing my relationship with food. And then I kind of went to the other extreme of like, I can have this and it'll have no effect on me. And you know, <laughs> because I went so far the other way. Right. Yes. And, um, and then I kind of just had to go through this period where I just kind of let whatever happened happen. And I recognized that it wasn't about the food. And even the times I started to be cognizant of when I was using it as a tool, I'm like, Oh, I am not in the pandemic specifically. I lived in New York city and I lived uh, alone and I didn't get to see people very often. And I suddenly started craving sugar more and I was eating more sugar, right? We only have so many <laughs> outlets and ways of experiencing like the chemical production. Right. And I'm like, Oh, I am totally using this as a replacement right now for the lack of like, like being hugged, like the connection. 
And I'm okay with that. I'm just gonna like, right now, this is a survival time and I'm gonna engage with that. And I know what's happening. And so it felt slightly more empowered than it was just this thing happening to me. Um, and then that phase ended after a while. But that was a really interesting point to be so, I still, I still like let myself have that, but to be mm -hmm. aware of what was going on and still recognizing what the underlying need was. Yes. Yeah, so we've talked about secondary gains. Yeah. This is one of those interesting ones. Um, we often are very controlling around food mm -hmm. because our ultimate fear is that if we don't, we will end up just consuming everything out there. Yeah. And that, that those extremes are still that bit of lack of trust. So we've got more work to do here before we start having to, con you know, do the food control. Yeah. So when we start to realize like, oh wait, so worthiness is so huge because people think like, oh, I will just eat junk and trash if I don't control the way I eat, right? Well, the uh -huh. way I think about food. So I've got to label foods as bad foods uh -huh. or I won't, won't avoid them. Mm -hmm. The thing that we just don't understand fully is that when we have value and worth and it's known and it's experienced and we're not just trying to like positive affirm that every day to right. believe like we're not just trying to say it in the mirror every day so that we maybe believe it eventually yeah when we have experience with it and again not a rival but just enough mm -hmm. where we know that it's there we actually feed our body in an appropriate way in a way that actually you will crave nutrients mm -hmm. versus those dopamine hits of sugar mm -hmm. you will start to actually crave nutrients i can tell you this happened to me and it's where I, and I am not getting into the rights or wrongs or highs or lows of any of this, but I eat a plant-based diet. So I try to eat whole foods plant-based. Um, the, the, I started craving nutrients, nutrient dense food mm -hmm. rather than the fast, easy food. And it was started, it aligned because I was starting to crave more deep, nutritious, experiences, mm -hmm. relationships, mm -hmm. that was more what I was feeding myself on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. And then the food just replicated it. Right. It was, diet wasn't the way in. It was just, it wasn't something like you thought about and planned out. It was just, as you worked on this one thing, you found that you naturally were drawn to. It was a lot and easier. It was intuitive sort of. Yes. And that whole thing about intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. Like I did try that before, before, and then I was like, intuitively, I want to stuff every sweet and thing, <laughs> that thing into my mouth Yeah, because intuitively I needed love. Yeah. I needed nurturing mm -hmm. that was in alignment yeah. with, but the food can't ever give it to you. Yeah. Now you get a dopamine hit. I'm not going to, right. that is the case. You will get dopamine, Yeah. but it, it's, it's a fast hit where real love and relationship has a la longer lasting effect on our serotonin levels and our dopamine. Mm -hmm. And we're not getting, we don't need those quick hits, Yeah, which food gives us that. And it's a bit of more that synthetic way of keeping ourselves in a good place mm -hmm. feeling wise. Yeah. So this tracks back to what I was saying in the beginning. We need some time we need to do the work yeah. of establishing those things in our in our history, in our mind, the wiring, so that our decisions on food and lifestyle and schooling and who we interact with supports. But we just do it the opposite way. Yeah. We have food gives us, we think, mm -hmm. nurturing or, or or health. Yeah. Food gives us health. Mm. Food makes me feel good or feel bad. Yeah. Well, then the power's in the food. Food is just food, mm -hmm. right? Or the job gives me, or the place I live gives me, or yeah. the friends that I have gives me, right? And it's all that. It's It goes back to where we put the power. Yeah. You've done a lot of work. Yeah. You've done, we still haven't changed what that we call it work, so we're just going <laughs> to keep calling it that. You've done a lot. Yeah. You've given to yourself and invested in yourself and sat with yourself a lot and loved yourself. Yeah. And really given to yourself in a lot of ways. You have that established sort of 
set point right that now is allowing you to go okay what is within my power and my agency mm -hmm. and what are some of the things i actually just don't want to engage with anymore yeah that came with time yeah and that came with the building of trust and i think that that's it's so important i i really saw this in my own life when I started to become uncomfortable with, I can't, mm -hmm. because I, it started to feel really not congruent. Yeah. Whenever I said, I can't, oh, a big, I can't do this anymore. Was my way, can't know, it's like my way of saying, I can't tolerate this anymore. Yeah. I, and changing can't to don't want to, don't feel like it. Yeah. Isn't serving me best mm -hmm. was, life changing, but I couldn't just change the words. I had to, it had to come because that change came because it started to not feel right. It started to not feel right to say, I can't do something. Mm -hmm. like, because you had such an amount of internal reference that showed you otherwise. Power was just like, <laughs> so whenever I said I can't do something, I was my, like one of my immediate mantra reactions would come up. Like there's nothing you can't do. Mm you know, it's so yeah. different than the mantra I had in my head for 30 plus years. Yeah. So that whole, like, there's nothing you can't do. I was like, okay, I just said, I can't do something in my belief system. If there's nothing I can't do, then I go, oh, oh, I don't want to. Yeah. And that was so empowering. And then I got to explore, okay, why do I not want to, mm. you know? And I'm like, oh, it's not serving me anymore. This doesn't align. Yeah. I don't have to label it as bad. So gosh, right. guys, this goes for so many things. Relationships, mm -hmm. food, location, job, like all of those things. Relationship in general, my relationship with anything. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't have to be, this is what I've been starting to say lately. It's like, oh, it doesn't have to be a problem to be a preference. Yep. I just get to, I can, and I, I feel that too, right? The, the sense of, oh, okay, I can do this. And then it becomes more practical of, okay, so what does that mean for me? What does that look like? What's the amount of effort? Does that feel worth it to me? Do I want to? Yeah. Yeah. So another little backtrack of this, and yeah. I think partially why, so on my journey, I started out with this form of EFT, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but what I noticed is in the community, like if someone would start crying, mm -hmm. they would say, tap on that. Like you can tap on that. And, and everyone would say that, like, you can tap on that. You can tap on that. Yeah. And, and, and yes, you can, I guess, like do the, yeah, yeah, all these things. <laughs> right. But I started to, to have some, I, I saw over time, people just shifted this into a coping mechanism. They were just using it to avoid. Yeah discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I was realizing like, no, actually there's a lot of growth in that discomfort mm -hmm. phase. And why would I try to tap on crying? Right. Like <laughs> oftentimes the crying was a message to me that there was something deeper. It was an invitation. Mm -hmm. And if I just tried to it away, I was missing yeah. things. And so the people that had gotten, had stayed in that system for long periods of time, mm -hmm. I realized were um, just had gotten really good at avoiding with this particular modality. Yeah. And stuff started to come back up again. And I was like, Ooh, I don't want that. <laughs> like something, what's this? Yeah. And that's where I came away from that and wanted to have a different framework around that. Mm -hmm. So it's the, but I needed the, I needed the time and the trust built with myself. So I do want to keep saying that. Yeah. If you're like, first tuning into this is your first episode. <laughs> Please go back and listen to the other ones because yeah. we build. This yeah, is one we're of those things we build on. This is definitely a building one, this episode especially. Yes, is that you, like you've got to, otherwise we're trying from that, that out in. Right. Oh, yeah. oh, you mean all I need to do is say, I don't want to rather than I can't, and that's going to change everything. Not if in your mind is like, you can't, you can't, you can't because you're not worthy and you did it da, 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 and you have all these mantras that are continuing. We're not cognitively bypassing the subconscious resources. We're working to ch like actually change the building blocks from which our beliefs are formed. Yes. Otherwise you are saying you're doing it the way we're talking about and you're still doing it the other way. And then that creates this incongruency, this cognitive dissonance that 
can, can cultivate a lack of trust. Then you'll say mind change doesn't work. <laughs> and I would say not the way you're doing it. <laughs> no, not the way. And it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Right. There's just a different, you need to come back. There's some foundational things that have probably not been met. Yeah. And there's a good reason for that. Mm -hmm. Nobody's doing it wrong. You're not a flunky. These are all belief systems, yeah. right? Of like, yeah. I can't do it. Maybe the approach needs to change rather than the modality. Yeah. Because we see a lot of people modality hop for this reason too, mm -hmm. right? So yes, the, those two examples, so food and then also just the, you know, all kinds of stuff. Does that help? That does. Do you have a more sensitive entry point? Well, I was just thinking about I, re reflecting um, even just with some clients who've been coming in, uh, families, like, you know, family situations. And as you go through these layers, you know, things that you think are really healthy because, or I'm thinking right now of a specific example. Um, I knew I had a friend who was, uh, dating another friend of mine and um, got really close with their family. And they had thought, oh my gosh, they were kind of being called out <laughs> on their uh, lack of thoughtfulness and compassion with other people. And they're like, as they started to kind of like recognize how out of tune they had been in considering other people's um, reactions and feelings, it was really helpful to them. But then there was a little bit of this extreme, right? They're like, I just, now I want to be a person of compassion and I want to do it. I want to be really healthy like this family. And I, and as I saw them, I'm like, oh, there's a great deal of enmeshment here. Mm -hmm. And so there are ways in which some of that is, it's kind of the extreme of the need that you have to be met. And that is healthy. But then there came a point where at first that was the, that was the initial point kind of bringing through the journey. But then it's almost like you hit these points of what, because you've been so malnourished, right? It's like, you need a heightened dose of this particular kind of nutrition, so to speak. But then once that is met and you've experienced it, you start to recognize, oh, this is no longer the healthy thing for me. This is actually in some ways impeding the growth or it could be considered toxic again you can get them to a different place where it's not good or bad you don't have to label it but recognizing oh i thought this was healthy and now it isn't so sometimes it's like when you choose okay cool i can recognize i'm in this environment and it's not quite as healthy do i change me and how i interact with it or do i decide oh i think i actually would just rather invest in some different relationships Look, there's a lot there. <laughs> there is. <laughs> okay. And I kind of transferred. I started with like an outsider because I thought that would be easier to contain it because it seemed a little bit clearer. And then I shifted it to be about me. I think if I'm getting really personal, obviously, there are times where I recognize that. And, and I've, I, will, I have more of a tendency to be like, oh, okay, cool. Let me change how I show up in this environment. Let me change how I am in this relationship. And then there come points where I realize, oh, maybe like I've changed a lot. Like I've gotten so much from all of the ways that maybe uh, this would have triggered me. I'm mm -hmm. using your quotes before. And that's been such a gift. And I'm so grateful. And I've grown so much. And now I don't know that I want to continue investing here. Like it's given me so much, but I want something different. But there have been points where I would use that, be like, well, I can't with this person. Or I can't in this environment because I'm having such a reaction. There were also time, I think, I tend to think now in terms of, it's not because I want to move away from something. It's not I'm avoiding something, but because it's about what I'm moving to. It's like, oh, I just want something else more instead. But there have been times where I recognized and I chew, I wasn't entirely there yet. And I chose to step away from something. Um, and that really helped my growth far more than if I had just stayed and kept trying to change me. Yes. Okay. I think we're again, dancing close to the extremes that we do as humans. Yeah. And one of which is, and, and I, I, I've heard this actually, again, back in that, the, form of EFT we were using, what was said is everything that a person says is about themselves. Yeah. So oh, always- Oh, I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. All, like everything a person says is about them. Yeah. And so, and, and again, to take that 
which I, there is some truth. There's some truth in that. So uh-huh. we'll, we'll piece out what is true in that, but then, but, but the blanket statement of that can get dangerous. Yeah. And can, there's a lot that can happen in there. So what the person who said that a lot, I could see like, oh, that's a protection mechanism for you. Because frankly, there's a lot of stuff you need to change that you just like when people are trying to be helpful and reflect and give some feedback, wouldn't hear it because, well, if that bothers you, you change it. You change you. Yeah. Okay. And there, there's, there is some measure of truth in that and power in that. We always want to seek where the power is, I think, is the, okay. the thing. Now, the extreme of that example is, and I heard this in that in that community for a while, an example of a woman st- that was in a, an abusive relationship. Husband was physically abusive. And what was said, not so much publicly, but a little bit in a smaller private group from someone sort of leading in that way was, well, if she'll change her, he will likely stop hitting her. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that gets, yeah. Now guys, listen, there, there, I don't even want to say that there's a measure of truth in that because that just isn't okay. It's like not okay. Right. I think where the power is, let's take that example and it's extreme. And if this is, if this, there's a trigger warning yeah. a little late, Yeah. <laughs> this is your experience you may want to shut off and come back at another time. Um, okay. <laughs> How do I move forward in uh-huh. a gentle way? No, because I'm addressing this because this was said and, and we want to make sure you know, that we're never lumped into that belief system because that is not a belief system I think we align with. No. If we get into the, the nitty gritty of that mm-hmm. and, we're, and let's say we're helping this woman as a client. Are there things that she, removing her from that situation, of course, like physical abuse. Yeah. If we don't deal with how she got there, right? likely, more likely than not, she'll end up there again. Okay. So thinking the best of everybody involved and going back to that situation and that being said so strongly, like if she changes, he'll stop hitting her. I'm going to think that they were thinking the very best and understand what they're really trying to communicate is there's a program and a pattern that is likely something that would help this woman to to get into, to get into in her own life. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. In no way would I ever want to that to be construed as, as the fact that we are saying she is somehow anyway responsible for the fact that she's being hit yeah no. not cool no not okay at all. no no one should ever lay hands on another person it just shouldn't happen but it does happen so let's talk about that if this one were my client would i say to her right away you need to get out of that house not in the work we do i do not do i don't give advice i don't tell people what they should or shouldn't do if she's coming to me and i am in an abusive situation I'm going to go into her empowerment. We're going to go in and we're going to help her understand how stinking worthy she is, Mm -hmm. how absolutely priceless she is, Mm -hmm. how she deserves every good thing. She deserves to be talked to good and touched good. And we're using the word good, but in a way that feels good to her. Yeah. And very likely in her history or in her past, there was some compromise that was made, probably outside of her control mm-hmm. when she was a child. Yeah. And that got wired in a certain way. So what we want to do is empower her and give her the power so that for her, mm-hmm. she's, if something were to happen, she would that would be so incongruent in her body mm-hmm. and in her mind. Yeah. She'd be like, oh, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, No. Yeah. And the leaving would not be a question. Right. If that's the case. Now, now that does not mean she shouldn't get out of the situation. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to make any blanket statements on, on domestic violence here. That's not the goal. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is, 
for her, the best thing or him, the whomever, yeah. they need to really deal with what's going on inside of them. Do they have to do that while being, while staying in the situation? No, if they really, I think in a physical abuse situation, you need to get yourself into a safe place. Mm -hmm. Now that means a lot of different things. Like get into a safe place. Don't allow that to happen any longer. But then the works begins there, right? Now I know, and, and I do understand, I come from domestic violence. That's not always easy. Getting out of that is sometimes life-threatening, the getting yeah. out of it. So again, we're not doing a domestic violence episode here. Right. Not speaking on that in any way, shape, or form. What I am trying to say is avoiding the extreme of the, the power being outside of her, making it that the only, like the, it's everything's going to change and she's going to be better in every way, shape, or form by just removing herself from the by physical only violence. only dealing with the external environment. Yes. It's an example to look at how there's, there is a reality to the external environment that we are in mm -hmm. and to the internal environment, how it interacts with that. And so just dealing with the external environment isn't going to give us the fullest amount of change that we want if we're not dealing with the internal one. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now, guys, I know that's such an extreme example, and I'm sure people are just <laughs> trigger, trigger, trigger. I get that. Yeah. And it probably would have felt triggery to me too, coming from a history of that. But what we're, I, if we can sort of step, take one step back of our personal experience and take this as a whole, because if we keep putting the power outside of us that we can only change and have any sort of worth, value, or power, if the circumstances outside of us are ideal. I think the thing I would like to, people to hear me say is, I'm not sure we know what ideal is until we've dealt with some of our own stuff, mm. until we've gone back and said, maybe, maybe, what's I, maybe my level of ideal is actually so low <laughs> and doesn't give me much value or worth. Mm. Maybe what I'd be willing to settle for, like don't just settle for the fact of someone not hitting you. Yeah. That's a low level settle. Yeah. Get out of it. But low level, that's a low level settle. And I, we want people to do more. Mm -hmm. Like know how valuable you are. Know on every level why that wasn't okay. Yeah. And even to be able to make peace at some point with saying with that person who was, was the abuser, like to hold on to that person being evil and vile and dangerous and everything and, and so scary actually doesn't serve that person in the long term either. In the beginning, it, it might be the motivation they need to leave. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's one of those things that serves someone in the moment, mm -hmm. but maybe won't serve them long term because then they're going to see through the lens of abuse and victimization in a lot of different areas yeah, and that can actually hinder them. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, I'm not wanting to minimize this because there's a lot of work that needs to be done in there, but that's a, a very extreme example where this work taken from that level of like, you just change, you, just change you. Yeah. You just change you and everything's about, you know, like, no, 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 not everything's about that woman that there's, that there's two people and there's something happening on that other side or that man, there's something happening with that partner that is, they need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Clearly, mm -hmm. you just changing you and figuring out you're worthy doesn't necessarily equate to that person not doing that anymore. Now, that being said, we've seen that happen. I've had clients where this happened, where physical abuse was present. Mm -hmm. And in the, the healing of childhood trauma, there was a massive change in the partner and they then sought help. Mm -hmm. And so, and I don't think it was one of those, um, like very, very dangerous situations. It's all dangerous because anything that damages our worth or speaks against our worth and our value is a, I think a dangerous situation, but there has been changes and there was healing. Yeah. And there was the, that change in that person, them recognizing their worth and value then sparked that in the partner mm. and they wanted to go on that journey. And then they are in a, just a different relationship altogether because they both entered into a different relationship with themselves first and then could enter into that 
that joint situation, that joint relationship very differently. But that's a lot of layers. Like that's a lot of different stages. For, yes. Yeah. So to put that on someone else and be like, well, you know what could happen? Yeah. If you work on you, he could stop or she could stop. Well, yes. But you've, you need your protection and your safety and your value and your worth and, and learning all of that and finding a place where you can in safely invest in that is the utmost concern. Yeah. And so sometimes we say this actually, and this is why we will not work with teenagers. Not that they don't need help because, oh, heavens, growing yeah. up where I bless their entire soul. <sighs> But if we get in with a teenager mm -hmm. and we change some of their coping mechanisms and yet their environment has not changed, their primary caregivers are still maybe to the best, doing the best they can, but are still offending in a way that the teenager's problem is actually a coping me mechanism to stay safe in the family environment. Yeah. For us to go in and tell that child, that teenager, well, here's how you need to change is not, it's just reinforcing the problem. Yeah. So the teenagers do need help. But what we always say is if there's someone who come fix my teenager, we, no, the parents need to do the sessions first. They need to do the work first. Yeah. And quite often, and that's one of those things, <laughs> quite often they see really different behavior in their teenager all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. it's so strange those internal scripts changing. Okay, so that's interesting Tate, the where this has gone and working into working with teenagers. We're actually going to release this episode. I don't know. <laughs> and, but going back to um where you were using an example of we were talking about kids in school and it being okay, this isn't the ideal environment, but we started that with you're like okay, here are the preconditions, right? Is everybody's on board? And so how do we how do we start with First of all, everyone's on board and then letting the internal sense of worth build and be known and the agency. And then there's the power coming from within to choose how to interact with the environment. Right. Well, okay. I'll use it a personal example. Again, it's safer, safest place to be. Uh, it was with Kent and I actually. Yeah. So over time with my change, you know, and understanding how uncomfortable that was for him, I realized that unless the like environment changed in one sense, unless Kent decided to come on board and do some of his own work, like we weren't going to be able to keep going forward. Didn't mean I didn't love him. Yeah. Didn't mean I couldn't maintain my changes. Right. Right. Or that somehow the power was outside of me. I just realized moving forward, the way that we're interacting, I can be just as patient and everything, but it's him, his worth and his value is trying to come from me. And that's not something I'm willing to accept any longer. I don't accept responsibility for someone's happiness any longer. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that uncomfortability was uncomfortable for a long period of time. Yeah. And rather than threats or ultimatums, I did maintain a, a state of the best thing for both of us moving forward is if this dynamic doesn't change, then it's not healthy for us moving forward for either one of us. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the space that I held. And I really made it about the dynamic because the dynamic presupposed there were two people involved, mm. right? Or multiple, if we're talking about a family dynamic, there are yeah. multiple people involved. And mine was, I am unwilling to continue moving forward in this way. And thank goodness he decided to do the work. Yeah. Had he not, I don't think we could have stayed married not because I'm like, ha ha, I'm better and now I don't love you anymore. No, not like, in fact, I loved him more yeah. <laughs> because I loved myself more. Yeah. And I realized that the the old patterns, if he wasn't going to be able to maintain them, this was going to be miserable. He was going to be miserable. Yeah. 
and I was going to be miserable and that wasn't going to be good for either one of us. Mm -hmm. So that was, and, and it wasn't an overnight thing. This, this was an years in the making, right? So it wasn't a rash decision and it was a lot of conversation and a lot of meeting each other where we were at at the time and evolution. Yeah. And so I think that's a great example mm -hmm. where, you know, the environment, what it didn't have to change. Right. But over time, it, I wasn't going to engage with it anymore in that way. Why? Because I was giving power to the environment? No, I was, I was staying in my power and saying, this isn't best. This isn't thrive ability. Mm -hmm. This isn't actually the best for our children. It isn't the best for this person, other person that I love. And it's not the best for me. Yeah. And that it was all of that was okay. And so, you know, obviously that had to change a lot of, or challenge a lot of frameworks mm -hmm. that we were staying within, but you know, and it was really good. Yeah. And he did make a lot of changes and I made a lot of changes based on the changes he made. Yeah. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm great. And then Kent changed and everything was better as he evolved and changed. It called me out a lot more with the way I was like, Ooh, that's just uncomfortable. Him stepping into part, particular parts of his power. Yeah. were uncomfortable for me. Mm -hmm. And I had to then deal with the way that I felt about that. Yeah. And I think that's more where we want to land is feedback. And I started to see that as all of it is feedback. I get to choose how I respond to it. Yeah. And I want to respond in a particular way, but it doesn't mean that I have to stay with that stimulus continuing to happen. Mm -hmm. I can, I still have choice. And if I choose to, that was my choice. Yeah. I have to own that. Yeah. But I also have to say over time, this isn't the kind of stimulus I want to keep having to, to challenge. So I'm just not there. And I want to move on. Yeah. I want to move into something different, like you said. Yeah. So I don't, I can't, if I, this is bad and this is awful and it's the only way I'll move forward. Now I've given it power. Yeah. Rather than I have the power and I can change and I choose that I choose to see that right now, this is not the best thing for me. Understanding, I choose to see it that way, which means I am aware I may be filtering it. Yeah. Okay. And right now with the filters that I have, to the best of my ability, I'm unwilling to continue in this space. And then I will make an adjustment to that. Or sometimes, and then I realize like, oh, I'm the one that needs to adjust here. And other times I realize like it would be more comfortable and for both of us, it would be better for both of us for there to be an adjustment on the other side. And then I give space for that. Yeah. Does that help? That does. Actually, <laughs> all the different spaces that we go and went to exploring right. this is some really extreme examples, some subtler ones. Yeah. But it coming back to it's a progression of the work. You get there later. You have, you really need all of those steps, but you get to a point where you understand you have filters. And, um, even if you, you don't necessarily know what all of them are and that's okay. It, it, it's like, we're moving past the good, bad to make our decisions. And it's coming so much from a place of worth so much from a place of power that we then get to, we can take all of that feedback in and then choose at this point in time, how do I want to interact with that with appreciation for it all, knowing that we can continue to adjust? And it really goes back to our tagline, right? Which is changing the world one mind at a time. That's really the only way the world will change. Yeah. Is by each of us understanding our own relationship to it. Yeah. Our own power. And when we all start to realize our own worth and our value and our power, and that becomes the collective known the world will change yeah. because that's, we do create the world. All of us create the world. So that's the best way I can change my environment is to change myself. And that being said, that sometimes allows me to see which environments are for me healthier and not healthy at the time, but where I'm at right now. And that's the idea of sovereignty. And that's the idea of power. And then I can make those choices, which, but that means I'm responsible for those choices. Yeah. And I might even look back and go, oh, oh, I left that because like I got out of that situation because I wasn't willing to meet the level I was being called to at that time. Yeah. 
So do I look, do I beat myself up about that? No, I wasn't there yet. Right. I can't, I'm not there. So, okay. I wasn't there. I was doing the best thing for me at the time, but because I'm not moving out of things in hate and anger and rrr, then it's okay that I moved beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure we'll revisit this. And um, please, if you are just tuning in, go back. I can, I can understand where this may be a little bit like, we don't, what are you guys talking about? And understand that we do have a bit of a framework that we put into this to be able to, to say those yeah, things. Yeah, to come to this conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you again mm -hmm. for joining us on the Mind Change Podcast. And I am Heather McKean. Please like, subscribe, download, follow us on social. We have so many wonderful things for you to be a part of and a wonderful community of people who are on this journey with each other and with themselves. But thanks again for joining us. See us next time as we continue to change the world one mind at a time.